I'm Jim Adler, the chair of the colloquium committee. Normally, we'd be hearing from Marilyn now, um, our wonderful president, and she's here, but she's suffering from laryngitis. And she asked me to say that for once she's speechless. <laughs> I, I thought it was a pretty good line, but I didn't want to use it without attribution. <laughs> we particularly want to welcome our guests, tell you how pleased we are that you're here. Uh, we invite you to um, show some interest in the Plato Society, and if we intrigue you, um, if you'd like to join us in our journey into learning, there's information on the table just outside the door, and we hope you'll pick it up. Uh, today we have a very sp special treat, both in learning about Mars and the exploration of Mars from Dr. Fook Lee, the director of the Mars Exploration Directorate at NASA's JPL. Dr. Lee received his bachelor's degree in 1975 from MIT and his doctorate in 1979 from, also from MIT. Since joining JPL in 1979, Dr. Lee's directorate, this is quite a list, has been responsible for two orbiters, Mars Odyssey and Mars Reconnaissance Orbiter, two famous rovers, Spirit and Opportunity, the Phoenix Stationary Laboratory, which landed near the North Pole in 2008, and the Mars Science Laboratory Curiosity rover that was sent to the Red Planet in 2011 and landed there in 2012. And we, we've got some wood for him to knock on. I asked him uh, when I met him if they'd had any serious failures, and he said, not yet. <laughs> so hopefully we haven't jinxed him. In 2007, Dr. Lee received the NASA Outstanding Leadership Medal, and in 2008, the NASA Distinguished Service Medal. And I think after hearing him and seeing what they've accomplished, you'll understand why. Dr. Lee was born in Hong Kong and received his secondary education there prior to coming to the United States. Dr. Lee, thank you so much for being here. Uh, good afternoon. Thank you so much for helping me here. Uh, I'm delighted to share my, some of our discoveries and, and our excitement of doing Mars exploration robotically. Um, what I'm going to do today is to give you a summary of the exploration work that we've been doing. Uh, but I'll be spending about three quarters of my time talking about the Curiosity rover, the one that James mentioned that was landed on Mars on August 5th of last year. So the first thing that I want to do is to give you a sense of Mars as compared to our Earth. Uh, the two pictures here shows you Earth and Mars. Mars diameter is roughly one half of that of the Earth. So the surface area of Mars is roughly equal to the land mass of the Earth because three quarters of the Earth's surface is covered by water. The Mars is about one and a half distance further away from the sun than the Earth is. And given the way that things work out, Mars goes around the sun in a little under two Earth years. And every now and then you hear me talk about we're doing the exploration of Mars for one Mars years. And one Mars year is roughly, again, two, uh, 690 Earth days you know, in, in that range. Because it's so a little far away and other reasons, Mars is extremely cold compared to the Earth. Uh, you can see here the average temperature would be at minus 67 uh, Fahrenheit, which is probably what Chicago is today. <laughs> so uh, I'm glad we're here. Uh, when I was driving down here, my, my car reached 91 degrees. I don't know how about your, your cars. The other thing about Mars I'll mention briefly is uh, it has a, an atmosphere, but it's very thin. Is of the order of 8% of the Earth's atmosphere, and it's largely carbon dioxide. So from this point on, I'll talk a little bit more about the exploration program that we have. Uh, it turns out, given where Mars is and where Earth is, we can launch one of our robotic mission of the order of 26 months. Every 26 months, we can go to Mars. If you want to explore other places, uh, it, uh, the alignment is different. 
And frankly, if you want to go to the deepest part of the solar system, it takes a long time to get there. What, when we launched to go to Mars, the trip that the spacecraft would take typically lasts somewhere between eight to 10 months, and then we'll get to Mars. So we can go there as frequently as every 26 months, and it doesn't take a long time to get there. NASA has done a number of multiple firsts when it started exploring Mars back in the 60s. As is listed here, in 64, it's the first flyby of a spacecraft of another planet, and the planet was Mars. And it might look like uh, a kind of a easy thing these days, but trust us, uh, in those days is really pioneering uh, advanced technology in those days. And Mariner 9 in 71 actually orbited Mars and took pictures of Mars at that time. And in 75, there were two systems, a, two landers and two orbiters uh, under the project title Viking that went to Mars. And the landers performed the first safe landing on Mars. And I'll show you the detailed landing information about Curiosity and frankly how scary that whole process really is. And in 97, the Pathfinder mission uh, landed successfully on Mars and it carried the first rover that uh, operated uh, on Mars uh, for a duration of time. And that rover is about this size, okay? And you'll see later on the rover that we have now are bigger. In fact, the rover Curiosity has six wheels, you'll see that. The size of the wheel is the size of this rover. So in 15 or so years, uh, the size of the rover that we put on Mars has dramatically in, uh, changed and increased. Oops, I did it the wrong way. Uh, one of the things that makes Mars a especially difficult challenge is because it's far away, and many of the activities that we have to do in putting a mission around Mars or especially on the surface of Mars requires that spacecraft do a lot of autonomous operations. Uh, typically when we land on Mars, the distance between Mars and Earth requires light to take off the order of seven minutes, 10 minutes, 15 minutes uh, to get back to Earth. However, the whole process of landing is only seven minutes. So by the time we started the process, if you wanted to you know, say, oh, I'm in trouble, by the time we get back to Earth, 10 minutes would go by. If, if we could figure out instantaneously what the trouble is, when we send the signal back to correct that problem, another 10 minutes would go by, the landing would have occurred whether we like it or not. And the joke we have at JPL is we're gonna land tonight, just, not, just do not know safely or not. So it's going to do it all by itself. And for this kind of reasons and the severe climate that we have on Mars, uh, humankind, the US, Russia particularly, Europe and Japan have combined to send 40 some spacecraft to Mars and Mars has won 26 times. <laughs> we lost 26 times. Now the betting average is roughly about 40%. Uh, and in baseball, you know, if you bet 400, you're great. Uh, but for us, betting 400 is not very great. So just want to make sure that you know. Uh, the program today are trying to address four fundamental things that we want to learn about Mars. The first among equal is the top line here. To try to understand whether Mars, either in the past or today, have the right conditions for the possible emergence of life and the sustaining of life. And if the answer is yes, that it had the right conditions, then the question is, did life arise? If not, why not? So this is the one of the fundamental things we're trying to understand whether other places in the solar system beside the Earth, or perhaps even outside the solar system, can be a place where life arise or arose. Uh, the other two things is to try to understand the processes, the climatological processes, the geological processes that are operating on Mars, and trying to understand those processes and try to understand why Mars become the way it is today from the origin of Mars when it, you know, four and a half billion years ago, and how come it became Mars of today and using those processes to also help us to understand how other planetary bodies, including our solid Earth here, how they may evolve over time. 
And the last thing that we do is to prepare for eventual human exploration of Mars. We wanted to make measurements uh, of Mars that are potentially very important for human explore explorers there. Uh, if there is water on Mars, it will become a source of water for the people who go there, and, and we want to find out where they are and, and, and how much and, and so on. So these four themes permeate how we plan our Mars exploration program. But again, even though we have four, the life issue is more central than all the other ones. Um, today, we have five spacecraft that are operating on Mars. Four of them came from NASA. One of them came from the European Space Agency called Mars Express. I put that up there because NASA had a, uh, a uh, collaboration with ESA on that mission. But I'm going to focus on NASA missions, the US missions. So as was mentioned by James, in 01, 2001, we launched an, a mission called Mars Odyssey, and it's working today. Uh, then in 2003, we sent two twin rovers to Mars, the Spirit and Opportunity. Uh, Spirit has, uh, has basically was stuck on Mars several years ago and has, uh, had, had not been working now. But Opportunity is still working. And in fact, tonight, there is a celebration at Caltech uh, on the fact that we have now been on the surface of Mars operating 10 years. Uh, yeah. Uh, it was designed to operate three months. So uh, you, you can see we were 40 times longer than we expected. Um, I, I used to joke that it's almost like when you buy a car, you expected it to last 10 years, and it lasted 400 years. <laughs> so it's that kind of, uh, of a situation we have. And uh, in 05, we launched the Mars Reconnaissance Orbiter, which is still also operating around Mars right now. And I'm going to focus uh, about uh, 20 minutes or, or more on the Curiosity rover. In, uh, uh, on the November 18th, last year, uh, two months ago, we launched this mission to go to Mars. It's on its way to Mars now. It will get to Mars on September 22nd of this year, and I'll tell you a little bit more about that mission. We also are continuing to collaborate with the European Space Agency on these two upcoming missions, which I'll skip over. At the end, I would, uh, the last chart I have talk about a mission that we're planning to be launched in 2020, about seven years from now, a little over seven years from now. Uh, now, I'm going to give you just one scientific finding of each of the four ongoing missions. The first one I mentioned is 2001 Space, the, the Mars Odyssey uh, mission. One of the instruments on board measures hydrogen. And on Mars, the general understanding is hydrogen is associated with H2O, water. Now, when we, before we went there, we did not know how much hydrogen we might or might not see. But it turned out that once we got there and made a hydrogen map, where the blue is when hydrogen is high, and this kind of color is when hydrogen, especially here, is low, and with that finding, basically, we were able to uh, figure out that Mars in both the northern and the southern polar regions have water ice deposits, either that are observable above the surface or just buried right underneath the surface. And it was a major finding that we have. Now, why are we interested in water? Because there is a general belief that uh, to sustain life or for, for life to occur on Earth, we need three major things. One is a source of energy, and on Earth, we have the solar as a source of energy, and there are other potential, biochem potential chemical environments that can provide energy. Uh, the second one is uh, water, you know, where, in fact, on Earth, when you have water, it's very seldom you don't find life in the water. Uh, I bet you this is filled with stuff that I don't want to see. So, uh, and the third uh, uh, element is the right uh, chemical compositions and ingredients like the carbon, the hydrogen, the nitrogen, the oxygen, and so on. So those are the three things. So on Mars, among the first thing we try to look for is water. And this mission did find a measurable amount of water in these ice deposit areas. Okay? The next mission that we sent was the two rover, the twin rovers. And this is a, uh, a picture from the oppor Opportunity, I believe. Yes, Opportunity. And 
we found out that on the area that we landed, there are all these little, what we call blueberries. They look about the size of a blueberry. And that are chemical, uh, that are structures and chemicals that were formed in the presence of water. So we, based on this kind of observations, were very sure that groundwater existed on Mars. At some point in time, we don't know exactly when, but it existed there for a duration of time before these kind of chemical uh, stru uh, structures can be formed. And this is a picture taken from uh, the Mars Reconnaissance Orbiter over the last several Mars years. And it's a very interesting thing. We're looking at a, a slanted terrain, like the side of a crater, facing the sun. And as the season of Mars occurs, when it goes from winter to spring to summer back to fall, you will see there are lines like this. I hope it's doing it, okay? That comes when the season is warm and it retreat, or the features, they retreat when the season is cold. Uh, we are believing, but we cannot prove. That is because there is underground ice on Mars that at that particular time, when the season is warmer, the, the ice become liquid and the liquid kind of flow down this, this thing and form all these linear features. And when it became warmer, uh, colder again, it, they retreat because the, they become you know, ice, uh, solid ice one more time. I'll just mention also a little bit about this mission called MAVEN that I mentioned launch, was launched in November of last year. Uh, I mentioned that Mars uh, atmosphere is about only 8% of the Earth. There is strong uh, Believe, um, maybe you can call it a hypothesis, that back, uh, you know, billions of years ago, Mars had an atmosphere very similar to Earth. For some reason, that atmosphere disappeared. And when that atmosphere disappeared, some of the water also have disappeared. Some of that disappeared water became the polar ice that, that I showed you. Some of them probably have left the planet at also. The, the mission goal of this particular orbiter, which will get there in September this year, is to try to figure out what's going on in the upper portion of the Martian atmosphere. Try to see what's changing. Are things that are continuing today being escaping from Mars? And if so, what are stuff that is escaping from Mars and at what rate? And allow us, hopefully, to extrapolate billions of years backward to see what the Martian atmosphere was like eons ago. So this is coming attraction. It hasn't gone, gotten there yet. No, so I'm going to spend the rest 20, 25 minutes on Curiosity. <coughs> Curiosity is a roughly one ton rover that we built starting in um, 2005 kind of horizon. And we launched in, uh, right after Thanksgiving on, on the, in, a, uh, in 2011. And again, its goal is to map along the four themes that I mentioned before. But in this particular case, we are really going beyond looking for water because the, the other rovers have basically found evidence of water. We're looking for the specific question of um, whether Mars, the environment that we, have, we are exploring, was habitable. By habitable, again, it means that it has those three ingredients I mentioned, presence of energy, presence of the right presence of water, and then presence of the right chemical ingredient. Now, we are still not specifically looking for life, because later on I'll mention to you that looking for life, especially microbial life, is not at all easy. So uh, we're taking kind of one step at a time. And in fact, uh, the way I describe our program structure is we want to look for life, but we, uh, we don't want to try to hit a home run. We try to hit three singles. And so the first step is to basically look for the presence of water. The next step is to look for the presence of the right environment that it could be habitable. And then we'll go and see if we can find life. So I hope that makes sense to you. Now, the reason why we don't want to hit a home run right away, as you know, many home run hitters, they strike out. And so if you send a multi-billion dollar mission to there, not knowing exactly what you're looking for, and you strike out, uh, our, you as our taxpayers might not like us to try again. 
So we wanted to uh, read this scientific uh, puzzle one chapter at a time. The place that Curiosity landed is called the Gale Crater. Gale is an Australian astronomer. The size of the Gale Crater is about 150 kilometers. That we landed right around here. Uh, 150 kilometers is roughly the size of the big island of Hawaii. It's a, it's a crater, but for some reason, in the middle of the crater is a, a, a five kilometer high mount. And uh, no one today knows why you know, in principle, that should be a big hole, right? So uh, the crater is sort of a hole. But for some reason, the thing doesn't have a hole. It has a mount in the middle. And surrounding the mount is a, flat, a set of flat area. And we, ra we landed right on the, on the floor, of, if you will, of that crater. But from the floor of the crater to the top of the mount is also roughly the distance uh, from sea level to the top of Ma um, uh, Mauna Kea. So if you happen to the big island, imagine the big island. This is roughly the terrain we're exploring. Uh, if you look at LA, this is roughly the size of the crater. Okay? I give talks a lot in Washington, which in many cases uh, they give us the money. So this is the Washington map, <laughs> you know, corresponding to the, to the thing. There are 10 instruments on board on this, on this rover. Uh, I, I will not f uh, describe all of them to you. As I go forward, when I show you some science results, I'll go back and tell you what, uh, who, which instruments were the, got, was getting what. But I would, mention, uh, I would mention two specific instruments that we call analytical laboratory instruments. And one of them is called SAM. It stands for Sample Analysis of Mass. And another instrument called KEMIN, Chemical and mineralogy or you know studies. This one is a machine that is inside uh, the uh, the rover chassis, inside the body of the rover, and we put powdered rock material to try to measure the atomic weight and the type of molecules those rock powder has in them. So this is, if you will, analyzing the chemical ingredient of mass. This instrument is actually an X-ray diffraction machine, and using that to measure the type of minerals we have on Mars. And I'll show you results from both of these instruments. But getting to Mars is not easy, as I mentioned. And uh, one of the first things that we have to do is to land successfully on Mars. Uh, I want to give you a sense of what, how difficult it is, because I mentioned already that Everything has to be done autonomously, so our spacecraft has to uh, do its own things when we get there. The spacecraft we have actually consists of three parts. Part one is this, this thing here, called what we call the cruise stage. It is the spacecraft that actually fly the rest of the spacecraft from here to Mars. Once we get near Mars, this guy is ejected. We actually separate, and this guy flies and burns itself up. Or Martian, you know, on, on the surface of Mars. The remain part is a capsule. Inside the capsule is the rover, which is nested underneath what we call a descent stage. And you'll see later on, the descent stage basically is a set of rockets that slow us down. When we get towards Mars, we separate, and then this particular system, the, the, the capsule, would rub itself against the very thin atmosphere of Mars to slow us down. Uh, that process is uh, nerve wracking because uh, you, cannot be, you cannot go in too steep, you cannot do it in too shallow, so it has to be just right. And I will give you a sense of the kinetic energy of this, this, this thing as we go in. Whatever kinetic energy we had entering Mars, we have to get it to zero because we want to put the rover very gently on the surface of Mars. So at the beginning, the velocity of this capsule is uh, 12,000 miles per hour. So uh, a 6,000 uh, meter per second, and on Earth, speed of sound is 300 meter per second, I think so. So it's Mark 20, it cannot be that low. It's, mark, it's a very high Mark number. 
and it weighs about one, uh, as I said, weighs about, uh, actually this capsule with the rover in it weighs about three tons. So the kinetic energy as this thing is plowing through is the equivalent to a number of things. One thing is if you have, have been on, how many of you have been to, the, uh, to Europe and ride and, and, and have been on the, the French bullet train? I think it's called TGV, right? It's about 25 TGVs running at high speed. So that's the kinetic energy that we have. Or about three 747s fully loaded flying at, uh, on Earth. But I have a different analogy that I want to go through with you. Uh, it turned out it's roughly the kinetic energy of 18,000 Formula One race cars running at high speed. So you will see this, if I can make this run, I'll use the analogy of the, of the uh, race cars and I'll tell you as we go through different stages of slowing down, how many race cars energy is left. Yep, it works. So the front part of the heat shield is rubbing against the atmosphere on Mars, slowing us down. I don't know how to represent 18,000 cars. This is my of so 18,000 cars. I think 18,000 cars are like 400 races at the same time. Now, when you watch race car, when I watch race car races, when you have a problem, you race one of these yellow flags, everybody slows down. Oh, we can. There is no yellow flag. We keep going. So when we get to a certain stage where the velocity has been slowed down by a factor of 10, we open up a parachute. By that time, it's about the energy of this capsule is about 80 race cars. We open up the parachute to slow it down some more. And when we get to a, the right speed, slow speed, we let this uh, descent stage with the rover tucked underneath it to come down. It's, at that time, it's about the ten, kinetic energy of three to four race cars. And so we still have to slow this three to four race car down to zero. And it's that engine. And when we get to the surface, it's roughly this, uh, this person's kinetic energy. So we went from... So we went from uh, 18,000 race car to one slow biker in seven minutes in a way that we cannot control. Furthermore, it's, uh, on Earth, it's easy for us to tell weather. On Mars, we don't have that good of an observational system. We do not know exactly, exactly, exactly how the wind is blowing and how much stuff we're going to see. So we're going anyway. So, as you know, we have been calling this, uh, you know, seven minutes of terror because we do not know how this is all going to work out. So I'm going to show you a, a, uh, uh, an, a, a video that, that I'm very proud of. This is landing night. This is 10.30 at night on uh, August 5th, uh, one and a half years ago. And this is a capturing of the people in, uh, at JPL, but also across the country. So you see this. I think, I, I'm not going to speak, you can just watch this. Things are looking good, coming up on entry. The able reports entry interface. At this time, it'll begin pressurizing the propulsion system to increase the thrust of the system. Uh, it'll use that for all the maneuvering in the atmosphere we're about to do. We are standing by for guided start, the start of guided entry. So we have people watching all across the, the, the country, and there are people watching at the uh, Times Square. That's now, Times Square is 1.30 in the morning. And the people who are brave enough to keep watching. That it has started guided entry. At this time, something is wrong with this video. It's way to the target. Uh, it's, it's skipping things, but that's We have seen peak deceleration. That uh, is starting the first bank reversal. Uh, it is reporting that we are seeing G's on the order of uh, 11 to 12 Earth G's. Yes. Bank reversal 2 is starting. We are now getting telemetry from Odyssey. I was sitting in the middle there, at the back, if you saw me. We should have parachute deploy around Mach 1.7. Parachute is deployed. We are decelerating. 
Speed chill step has separated. We're on the ground. We're down to 90 meters per second at an altitude of 6.5 kilometers in descending. Standing by for batch separation. We are in powered flight. We're at altitude of one kilometer descending. Standing by for sky crane. Sky crane is started. Single to us, you remain strong. Touchdown confirmed. We're safe on Mars. I'm going to stop there because the video is not too, not too if, if you want to see it later after the talk, I'll try to see if we can work, run better. Uh, uh, you know, now it's easy to see that, well, it worked, right? But when you were there, when it's happening, you really don't know what's going to happen. And it's a very nerve wracking. And the analogy that I like to say is, as you know, building one of these rovers and this kind of missions takes uh, literally thousands of people. And at JPL, at the peak, we were, we were, using, we were having more than uh, maybe 800 people, maybe 1,000 people working on it. And when we try to land, obviously, everybody wants to land these things to land. And it's almost like everybody's taking a final exam together. And everyone has to pass, you know, so that we can collectively pass. Uh, and uh, a lot of people think that it's very high tech, what we're doing. Some of it is high tech, but a, a huge amount of it is really um, you know, hard working, engineering, disciplined activities. If you make a small, it's like doing one million things in, that, in those seven, sec, seven minutes, and not one of them can fail. And we check each other all the time and, and so on, but you never know whether you really, could we have missed something? So you never really know. So when it really landed, everybody was jumping, some people were crying and, and so on, because I think people were not only uh, relieved, but they really were excited and, 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 and happy that, that we landed successfully. Uh, I was very happy, to, in case you, you, you want to ask. <laughs> now, so once we landed, the first thing that we sent back is, is this image looking from the back of the rover. And I mentioned to you, there is, we landed on the floor of, a, of the crater, and in the middle of the crater is this mount. In fact, the mount is named after Professor Caltech, uh, Robert Sharp. So this is called Mount Sharp. So there is this picture, and the shadow is the rover, the sun is on that side, you know, casting a shadow on there. So uh, this is a very, very first picture uh, that we had. And it's, uh, again, it, it came down within three minutes of, of after landing. It was just most gratifying. But once this got on the web, someone took this and did this. <laughs> I hope you have seen the Transformer movies. I don't think he was there. But now this is really a self-portrait of the rover. Uh, this is actually taken uh, about uh, uh, two months after we, we landed. And it took about, in the, the rover has an arm in front, and in, in the very tip of the arm, the arm stretches about the height of an MBA center. So it's about, I cannot, I think, can I reach the height of the, roughly the tip of my fingers. And at the front of that arm is a camera and we use that camera to do the selfies just that you do. And then we have to look everywhere. It took, I think, 57 pictures to, to, uh, to be synthesized into a self-portrait like that. And in this particular case, actually, we also dug into the Martian soil. You see these little marks here? We actually use this machine to dig into the soil, feed some of the soil into the analytical laboratories that I mentioned uh, previous, previously. After we landed, Mang Sharp is here. It's at the bottom here. Okay. And the place we wanted to go was from here to roughly there. But the scientists, in their wisdom, decided to go the opposite way. <laughs> and we went to this place called Yellowknife Bay. And um, I, I don't think I have enough time to, to, to tell you that they were not crazy. They, there is a reason they wanted to go there. And they, they were able to observe uh, uh, 
you know, very important signatures when we get there. The first thing that they saw when we were roving towards that Yellowknife Bay is the presence of a lot of stones, tight stones about this size, that have been compacted together, almost like cement. So from that, the scientists were already able to tell that this area that we landed in was a river about, with water about this high. And it's running of the order of a mile per hour kind of stream that was flowing by. And that transported and compacted the material that way. So we found water right away. And then we went into this yellow knife area to drill into an area called John Klein. John is uh, the deputy manager of this project. Unfortunately, he passed away. Uh, he has uh, Lou Gehrig disease and he passed away. So we honored him by naming him on this, uh, uh, this, this particular area. And you can see the arm again here. And the front part of the arm has a drill. They basically drill into this material, powder them, and then take those powder and put it into the analytical instruments. And this is a drill. Uh huh. I'll show you the drilling exercise. Oh, it's this one. Does it work? Uh huh. So it's a test uh, vehicle at uh, this. Uh, this So this is how the drill works. It's just, you know, it's, I'm not sure this is like a dentist drill or not, but, but that's, that's how it rotates. And when the stuff is drilled into powders, there is a little mechanism that actually put the stuff, kind of gradually sip, uh, move the stuff upward into the, the, the thing in the head, uh, at the head of the arm, and the head of the arm move around to filter them and put the filtered stuff into the and when we finish the testing, you can see how many holes we, we drilled. Okay, I, I joke that we should have been drilling into uh, bowling balls and sell the bowling balls. <laughs> now on Mars, this is the drill that we did. On one side was a test. When we did think the, the first time, we didn't quite know what we were doing. So we did a little bit, did a tiny hole to make sure that we know what we're doing. And then we drilled the, the real hole itself. Now, Immediately when this occurred, the scientists were extremely happy already. And the reason is Mars is known as the red planet. And the reason is because it is a very oxidizing uh, atmosphere and uh, the stuff is basically rust. The red color is basically iron oxide and it's very oxidized. Everything is oxidized. But this is not red. This is grayish, uh, greenish, whatever you want to call this color. And uh, they know right away, right underneath the, the, the top layer of the rock, the stuff was not oxidized. They were in a much more, what they call a reduced state. So if there had been organic material, they would not have been oxidized to become carbon dioxide. They could have been preserved. I hope that makes sense to you. So they were really excited when they saw this. They became, I'm going to skip this one. They became even more excited when they analyzed that stuff. This is the X-ray diffraction machine. I'm not going to describe why we have these patterns. But uh, in the, the drilled material, as compared to the soil, remember that I mentioned there was some soil that we just dug up? The soil diff um, uh, signature is like this. But the drilled rock material has this additional signature here, which is indicative of a thing called phyllosilicate, which is a kind of material that is formed, clay material, that is formed not only in water, but in neutral water, water that we can drink. And yes, good idea. And then they analyze it with this uh, machine that measures the type of elements, the type of mo molecules that we have. Uh, again, I'm not going to go through the details with you, but we found oxygen, we found uh, sulfur, uh, and there's clearly water in all these signatures thing that, that we, we look into. So in this particular area in the Yellow Knife Bay, we are now quite confident that once upon a time, it was habitable. By that we mean, A, it has an energy source, and for that matter, that there are minerals in this area that we analyzed that have different states of oxidation, and it turned out that if you are a microbe, you can utilize that those different states to extract energy on a chemical basis. It has water, it has neutral water, 
and the water is not very salty, meaning that it's quite pure. It's not like honey. If, it's, if you have honey, you, you, it's liquid, but it, very little water in it. A lot of stuff is stuff. And lastly, it has carbon, hydrogen, oxygen, phosphorus, and sulfur, which are all the key ingredients for life on Earth. Our objective to go there was to see whether this area was habitable. Touched down. It was habitable. In fact, I think we scored two points after. We scored eight points on, on this experiment because I think we basically found it. Now, we are not done. We are turning around and going to where we wanted to go, right? We, that was, we took a detour. So I mentioned that we, we went from here to, to this Yellow Knife Bay, and we are now down to roughly here. Going to, this is Mang Sharp. I'm sorry, this, the picture keeps changing uh, perspective. Mang Sharp is here. And so we landed there, and we're driving this way. And we're about 40% uh, there uh, or so. It's going to take us uh, quite some time to get there. It turned out that the terrain is extremely uh, tough, very, very rough uh, terrain. Um, we ex we uh, have to be extremely cautious. And when we get to this particular area, this, this region here, which is named uh, after Bruce Murray, one of the directors of JPL who passed away, uh, it was named in uh, memory of him. And then we'll cross over this region and climb into this region where all the mineral deposits that we can see from orbit are all here to allow us further understanding of how this whole crater came about. I mentioned to you that we don't know why there is a Mount Sharp in the middle. Hopefully, by analyzing material here, we learn even more. Hmm, interesting. What did I do wrong? So this is climbing to the, to the Mount Sharp foothill area. And this is a picture taken by the rover when we landed, looking at that, that direction. And when we are there, the rover will be about the size of this rock. So you can see roughly you know, how big this whole terrain would be. The rover, if you come to JPL, give me a call. I'll show you the rover. The rover is about the size of a uh, in fact, uh, the, the way we compare it to is a, uh, uh, a Mini Cooper. You know, it's almost exactly that size. And this is, uh, this picture actually is the one that I like the most. It's not taken by the rover, it's taken by the Mars Reconnaissance Orbiter. And this is sunrise on Mars. Mars rotates, sun is rising. And this is the Gale Crater. Do you see the Mang, Mang Sharp in the middle? Okay. So if you will, if you're standing, you're physically standing there, sun is rising. I like it so much because um, it gives me a feeling that every day, you know, there's another new day on Mars. And I just want to have many, many, many such days observing Mars when we're there. Uh, I want to talk a little bit about in 2020, we're going there one more time, we hope. NASA has, been, has announced that we're planning such a mission. And it will also be a rover mission, very likely built upon what we have done on Curiosity. Basically, using the chassis that we have, the rover, the, the shape of the rover, the wheels that we have, and the arms and so on, using similar landing uh, uh, scheme uh, that, that I've shown before. Uh, we'll do exploration of perhaps a new site, but at the same time, it's likely that we are allowed to uh, drill into rocks and preserve some rock samples in a box. And years from 2020, many years after that, we will go and take those samples and come back home with those samples. And that will be the first time when scientifically selected, carefully selected samples of Mars can come back to Earth for analysis. Now, why is that important? Because we need to go from the third base to home to talk about this live issue. And to look at the live issue, we believe would require all the best instruments on Earth. In order to utilize all the best instruments on Earth, many of them take up the size of a laboratory. We cannot miniaturize all of them and take all of them to Mars. Instead of doing take all of them to Mars, we take Mars to them. So we carry this. Uh, carefully selected sample back to Earth, 
and basically analyze those samples and see the fundamental question, are we alone? Or Mars also have life? Okay, thank you. Thank, thank you very much. I know that one question on everybody's mind is, have you found any organic materials on Mars to date? Uh, short answer is not yet. Uh, we are uh, we are looking. Um, no, short answer is no. Uh, let me put it differently. Uh, it is not teeming with organic material. Okay, it's not like everywhere you drill, they are they are just uh, they are just there. So uh, if it is uh, a lot of it, we would have seen it already. The signature is very very subtle. And so we, we haven't found it yet, but we're looking. Thank you. We'll take a question over there and then back here. I'm sorry, I cannot, I cannot I, see. I remember, I remember seeing pictures where it looked like definitely a stream bed and things. So somebody must have a, a guess as to what happened to the water on Mars. To the water on Mars? Yes. Uh, uh, again, some pe uh, not, we, we really don't know. Uh, I, I agree with you. Uh, many of the things, if I look at it with my untrained eyes, they look like rivers, they look like delta, you know, river deltas, they look like regions that water has carved out on Mars. The notion, it most likely, is some of those water disappeared when the atmosphere, you know, we lost 80, you know, 90 percent of the atmosphere, so some of the water left with it. When the atmosphere becomes thinner, the water basically uh, vaporized, and then they just left. Further, however, some part of it actually was uh, uh, most likely being today underneath the ground of Mars as ice. So exactly how it happened, we really don't know. Yes. Uh, I'm sorry. Since you mentioned that uh, the, you believe there may have been water uh, hip deep, do you suppose uh, or has anybody considered that uh, the existence of Mars today is perhaps a precursor of where the Earth will be millions or billions of years from now? Uh, and as I mentioned at the beginning, two of our objectives are to understand how processes operated on Mars, climatologically and geologically. And we do want to learn why Mars become the way it, it is today. Will Earth follow the exact uh, path? Uh, I honestly don't know. Uh, Mars had no, well, I don't think, Mars had human on it, uh, and, but Earth does, and how that interacts with the Earth, uh, you know, uh, is, you know, is a hotly debated topic. Uh, uh, there are three planets on, on that are, called, uh, there is four actually because of Mercury, but uh, the three bodies, uh, Venus, Earth, and Mars, are rather similar. You know, they're rocky planets, and they are roughly that size. Uh, but two of them has gone bad. You know, Mars has been very cold. It has very thin atmosphere. It has no easy access to water and so on. And Venus is extremely hot today. And Earth is Goldilocks just right. <laughs> and I don't think we know, uh, but it might point out that we have to be careful so that we don't become one of the two bad planets. Dr. Lee, yes. given the, uh, the success you've had using uh, robotic methods, why are we considering using people in space and the expense and the risk and difficulty? Uh, the, a very good question. Um, i like to answer it in a kind of an, uh, in a roundabout way, if I might. Uh, I personally believe, and it's just me as a private citizen, not an employee of NASA or JPL, that human wants to go places where they haven't gone before. And uh, in the past, there might be economic reasons why one would do so. Uh, there might be uh, military reasons why one might do so. There might be other reasons one might do so. But I also think that one of the reasons is people just like to go. You know, today there are people who climb Mount Everest. And to be honest, I don't know why, but they do it. <laughs> okay, and uh, 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 you know, I, I'm not strong enough, fit enough, and wealthy enough to do it, but other people do do it. And there is this innate sense that we should explore things that we have not, not been to. 
And to me, that would compel us to become not a single planet species. We'll go to other planets. And if you want to leave Earth, the only reasonable place that you can sustain for quite, quite some time is Mars. It is quite close to Earth, even though it's far away, but it's kind of the closest that there is. It has some water in it that we can utilize. It has a thin atmosphere, but, but it's not like the moon that has zero atmosphere, and so, and so on. So I think humans would, would go there just because we really want to go there. Uh, now, there may be other reasons, you know, uh, a space race or whatever reasons that we would go. But I think that even without those reasons, I think we, we ought to go. Uh, can we do good science with robotic systems? Of course we can. And we are attempting to. And I think that if, when, when human go, gets there, they would augment to the science that we, we can do with robotics. But I think humans are going to go there just because we want to go there. I, I want to go. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's, it's a very expensive thing, so I, I totally understand. Uh, I'm the, sorry. The lay scientific literature seems to suggest that the atmospheric question is a function of the internal heat of Mars, and specifically whether there was, there was a molten component. Mm -hmm. How is uh, Curiosity going to address that question? Uh, Curiosity was not uh, designed to study the internal structure and wh what Mars is. So let me go off on a tangent for a minute based on what you said. Um, there is a hypothesis, a, a story, perhaps not, not really a scientific kind. How should I say it well? Uh, my personal reading of the scientist talk is that most likely uh, in the ancient past, Mars has a molten uh, you know, in a, in a core, and it generated a magnetic field, a global magnetic field, like Earth does have it today. But for reasons that we don't understand, it stopped. And the magnetic field decayed away. Today, the following is actually scientifically measured. It turned out that there are remnant magnetic field, small field, on, on the rocks that we see on Mars that was derived from emission that I didn't mention, you know, back in 96 when we have the Mars Global Surveyor that detected this remnant field. But there is no global field. When we, Earth has a global field, it protects the Earth's atmosphere from the solar wind. The solar wind comes in, the, basically the magnetic field pushes that stuff and let them go around Earth. Once the global magnetic field died off, the conjecture, the hypothesis, the story, is that then the wind over time stripped the atmosphere away. So that, that uh, now Curiosity is not measuring those things. MAVEN will be. The mission that I mentioned that was launched in November is deliberately sent there to, to, to figure out whether I just talked was just, it was real or was just total garbage. So, so that's, that's what we're going. Yes. Um, I see where the various trials have been looking for conditions that sustain life as we know it here on Earth. But on all of this, I've always wondered, might there be forms of life that is different from what we know on Earth that requires and is, exist with, in a different chemical makeup, in a different atmospheric makeup that's outside the box of what our minds think of as life here on Earth? Uh, excellent question. I, I pondered that myself. Uh, I, I'm not a scientist in that, in that vein at all, but I, I'm curious, just like you are, whether there could be other um, non-carbon-based life form and, and so on and so forth. Uh, the problem we have is our knowledge is so limited. We can only try to find things like us if you think about, could there be other life form? Possibly. But what are they? How do you look for them? Where do you start? Uh, so I thought about it and I said, I don't even know how to start. But looking for our type of life form, we know how to start. Let's try that. It's kind of where we are today. As time goes on, if there are more uh, evidence scientifically that there are other potential life form, um, sure, we'll change our search strategy. But today, it's kind of, we don't quite know what to do. Yes, there's that possibility, but we don't even know how to start. I hope that, that addressed your question. Dr. Lee, uh, you've spent pretty much your whole working career at uh, JPL and NASA. 
how would you describe the expectations of what could be achieved when you started there versus what you've achieved today versus what you think can be achieved in the future? Wow. <laughs> Uh, let me tell you, uh, you mean achieve it? Briefly. <laughs> <laughs> you are talking about the space program, you are not about me, right? Uh, uh, let me give you the following, I don't know if... First of all, when I started at JPL, I didn't know anything. Uh, I was just so glad I had a job. <laughs> and I participated in a mission that eventually became a mission that mapped the surface of Venus. Uh, over the 30-some years I have at JPL, we have come a long, long way. You know, I show you the, the Sojourner, Sojourner rover that was, uh, you know, landed on Mars in 97, which is about this size. And today is, you know, we're literally uh, 100 times bigger. Uh, so our technological know-how has, has really, truly uh, evolved quite a bit. Uh, I expect us to continue to be uh, on that path uh, I don't know how the national economy is going to be like, uh, uh, and therefore what, whether that slope would be like that or would, would it taper off a little bit. Uh, but th this is a kind of a, 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 a circular kind of a thought in the following sense. Once we know something with something that is more capable, the question that it generates requires something more capable. And this is kind of how I saw the last 30 years uh, you know, when I was able to see what we were doing. And I expect that to be the next 30 years that way. So as I mentioned, you know, we want to go to Mars and drill and get some of these rocks, and then we have to send them back to Earth. Uh, just trust me, sending them back from Mars surface to Earth is a non-trivial thing, you know. Uh, it's very, very hard. You have to build a rocket, and the rocket somehow has to work on Mars. And then somehow it has to get to Mars, forget about working on Mars. And it has to aim at Earth. And somehow it has to get it done right and so on. Uh, so the, the technological challenges increases. Uh, luckily, the whole, uh, a lot of the aerospace technology, particular computer technology, frankly, the, the computer part, they improved without us. You know, the commercial, you know, uh, stuff just drive the, uh, the Moore's law of the computers. So I expect a lot of technological advances that will be, we'll be capitalizing on. But I think we'll, in fact, I hope that you all can support our space program and continue to give us the funding to try to push this. Because doing the same thing again uh, is useful, but not that useful. You know, if you send another Curiosity rover, to some other place, will we learn a lot of things? Of course we will. But would it be a dramatic breakthrough for the next step? I'm not sure. Yeah. I'll, um, so sort of a follow-up. Um, you, you say that the, the, oh, these sorry. missions are expensive. How, how expensive is a trip like the, the Curiosity? And um, how, how supportive is our current Congress uh, for the, the space effort? The second question, I'll plead the fifth. <laughs> So I want to ask for the first question, I actually have an answer. Uh, what is a movie ticket this day? I seldom see movies. Huh? 12 bucks. What is a matinee? 10. Ten. Uh, curiosity costs $8 per US citizen. So that tells you the, the scale of, of, of how much we spent. Uh, I am extremely biased, I'm extremely prejudiced, but I love this movie I'm watching with your eight dollars. Uh, I'm sorry, to, I can't see you. Oh, sorry. Uh, I'll apologize in advance if uh, you may need to help me with this, uh, phrasing this question, but the scientists at JPL and yourself perhaps, uh, those who are religionists, believe in God, what, how does that play into the universe and what you've discovered and was it, was it something else? Was it someone else who created all this? Uh, I'm not sure how to answer that. <laughs> I'm a Christian, so I believe in God myself. Uh, 
But I also found that a lot of these scientific studies uh, are peering into, uh, in my personal view, peering into the God's creation. That's my own belief. But I don't really want to go too much into it beyond that. Uh, my question is, uh, because of the high cost of these projects, to what extent are we collaborating with other countries to perform some of these projects? It doesn't have to be a U.S. program. A, a very good question. Many of these missions have a varying degrees of international partnership. If you look at Curiosity, uh, the two instruments that I'm, well, let's see, one, two, two of the instruments, one, two, three. Three of the instruments have co contribution from uh, uh, other countries. One of the th 10 instruments I show, actually, the whole instrument came from Spain. The uh, one that I measured, uh, atomic weight and you know molecules, that one, one third of it came from France. And there is a, a, a laser instrument at the top of the mast, uh, top of the arm, that, uh, uh, the ma sorry, on the mast, uh, it's also built one half by France. So there are uh, a fair number of international countries that participate in this, uh, in this endeavors. Um, similarly, I mentioned there is a European mission called Mars Express, among the very first chart I show, that the U.S. Became, uh, was a part of it. So there are enough, co there, there, are enough co there are definitely collaborations. Uh, can there be more? Probably, you know, in order to share the, uh, you know, to do, the, to do more with the limited budget that we, every uh, side have. Uh, scientifically speaking, I think it's the right thing to do. Uh, but when you do collaborations, um, it's a very, uh, I don't know how to say it, it's a very political thing. You know, it's not like uh, we do all the great stuff, you just do the, do the, you know, do the not important stuff. And then they will say, well, we do the great stuff, you do the not important stuff. So that, that, that process requires time and, and uh, negotiation skills so that at the end, both sides felt that is a good deal. Uh, so I think it will, it will continue to happen. Uh, and I think that most of our NASA missions are indeed in the international in nature. It's not, uh, I'm sorry, I don't see. Um, I have a question. If we look at the life on Mars, just the, the, that would be similar to life on Earth, uh, one of the main ingredients is nitrogen. And I was wondering if there is any sign of nitrogen on yeah. Mars. It, it, there is. The chart that I have left out hydro, hy, nitrogen. Uh, we found all of them. The six elements, nitrogen, oxygen, nitrogen, oxygen, hydrogen, carbon, sulfur, and phosphorus. I feel better. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> oh. Um, oh, um, do you have anything specific? I'm sorry. I cannot see you. Oh, sorry. Uh, Do you have anything specific planned with SpaceX? I know Elon Musk would love to deal with you directly as well as the federal <laughs> government. Uh, we don't yet have anything specific. Uh, SpaceX is a very, uh, you know, a great company, you know, launching spacecrafts of various kinds using their launch vehicle, the Falcons. And it is my expectation that they will become a provider of such launch capability. Uh, and I think one day there will be mass missions that will be launched with uh, SpaceX uh, launch vehicles. Uh, uh, Elon himself is an enthusiast of going to Mars and landing on Mars, and you know we'll we'll see how it all it, it all turn out. Uh, my question is regarding the mechanics of cannot, Curiosity. Oh, uh, is, does Curiosity sleep or rest at all, or, or is he or she constantly in motion, going from one place to another? Yeah, OK. Uh, that's a good question also. Uh, let me answer it with a very long-winded answer. If you look at the way we did Spirit and Opportunity, well, let me put it this way. Both spirit, opportunity, and, and then curiosity. We need an energy, electrical energy source. On the two MER rovers, uh, we use solar panels. And on curiosity, we use a thing called radio, radio isotope thermal electric generator. Basically, we have some material that radio, they're radioactive, they decay, they generate heat, we turn the heat into electricity. And all this electricity charges up a battery. The whole mission actually runs out on battery. 
And one of the key challenge of operating rover on mission is to not draw down on the available, not just uh, not power, but energy that is stored on, on, the, on the batteries. And in some missions, we have to sleep because there is not enough energy at night. And we have to keep the, at night, Mars is, can be as cold as minus 200 degrees. So you have to keep everything warm and not everything, but you have to keep something warm so that you, the next morning it doesn't have, it wasn't frozen dead. So uh, to keep those vital portions, you require certain uh, energy. And if there is not more energy than that, then the system just basically sleep. Uh, curiosity does not sleep, does not need to sleep in that sense. But it turned out that in order to operate one of these rovers, uh, the most efficient way is actually talk to it every Mars day. So what we do is on Martian mornings, we send a set of commands to it and say, for today, do the following things. And towards the end of the Martian day, Mar 6 o'clock, Mar 6 p.m. Martian time, they send back, this is what we found today. Then it's not that it has to go to sleep, is that we have to figure out what it did. And we took the time between that playback of data at 6 p.m. Mars, we work like mad to figure out what to tell it to do the next morning. Am I making, I hope I'm making sense. So it's not, have to, it doesn't have to sleep, but we cannot keep up with it if, if it keeps going. Uh, Mars day is roughly 24 hours and 40 minutes. Uh, so if we operate on Mars Day, which we, on all this rover mission, we do it for the first 90 days. Uh, if you have tried it, I don't think you have, uh, but if you have tried it, you will find out that you are constantly jet lagged, right? I mean, it's like flying one time zone, It'll, an hour, what's the big deal? But every day you're moving one time zone. And uh, try it when we land the next time and, and, and see how it works. After 90 days, no one can take it anymore. Uh, so from now, on, you know, since the 90 days, we actually operate Earth time. But when we operate Earth time, sometimes when we are our morning, it's their midnight. So for that day, we have no data. You know, we can go into JPL and for 10 hours, nothing happens because the data hasn't come back. I hope that makes sense to you. So there are some days that we cannot operate the rover because of those reasons. Um. Uh, Since Mars uh, and our own moon have no atmosphere to protect themselves, has NASA done any studies on how large an object, be it an asteroid or a comet, could hit these two bodies and change their orbit enough to affect the Earth? <laughs> uh, I don't think so. I mean, these bodies are extremely large, both Earth and Mars. The asteroids that we have, that I know of, are not huge, and you know they are a threat. If they come towards Earth, it uh, you know it could be a threat, but it doesn't fundamentally break the Earth apart, or, or fundamentally of such huge kinetic energy that can, uh, I mean, it will perturb the the, the the stuff a little bit. But but I, my understanding, again, I'm not. My understanding is very limited. Uh, it, is that it would not in a way that would fundamentally jog things around today. Now, in the early years of the solar system, where such phenomena occurred much more frequently, where such bodies are much bigger, there was a lot more perturbative and a lot more chaotic in those times. But today, my understanding is those asteroids are just not that big to allow, I think, what you are saying to occur. I have just a, a real quick question for you. Um, every U.S. citizen paid $8 for Curiosity, which is a good deal, really. But in your opinion, how much money would every citizen have to pay in order to send humans to Mars? Uh, short answer is I really don't know. Uh, the long answer is uh, the long answer is I think when. When we do want to go to Mars, uh, it will require a lot of money, a lot of years. But when that is occurring, space programs money is not bill, U.S. bills launched to Mars. Every single dollar is spent, frankly, paying people like me 
right? So the the is a uh, is an economic kind of consideration because you are frankly employing uh, I'll use word high tech you know capabilities of the country. So the question really is: Is that the right use of taxpayers' money? You know to invest in our technical arm of the society and to do this particular thing. Uh, it will take a long time. It's not going to be like, uh, unless there's something really dramatic, I, it's not going to be. Now, I still hope I can see it with my eyes, uh, but I don't know. Oh, sorry. Give I, my question was, is, is there a concern about uh, taking microorganisms to Uh, okay. Are there concerns about um, taking microorganisms from the Earth to Mars and contaminating Mars? And what, there, how do there, you do that? There, uh, there is a, uh, a clearly a significant concern. In fact, there is an international kind of agreement how to, uh, in fact, the field is called planetary protection. And there are uh, several ways, and uh, I should say there are several types of protection that we wanted to do. One is what you say. We don't want to carry Earth bug uh, that would contaminate Mars in a way that would uh, somehow thrive as a uh, bacterial colony on Mars. Uh, there, there is another reason why we, we have to be very careful is scientific in nature. I mentioned that we want to find life on Mars. The last thing we want is to find life and think that they occurred on Mars and turn them to be our stuff. So we have to be very diligent in making sure that we don't, we don't make Mars uh, uh, so dirty, if you will, uh, that we can no longer ask that question on Mars. So we try our very best. Uh, it's not perfect. It's, uh, killing bugs down to, a, to zero it's really not an easy thing. In fact, it's, it's not very practical to do. But we do it carefully. We reduce it you know, the best we can. Uh, in a, there, is a, there is a policy that says it has to be below a certain level. And we do that. And we are very careful where we land. Areas where there is water ice, um, uh, uh, presumably water can become liquid water. And if you have earth bugs that are still alive, uh, that can grow the colony. So there are regions of Mars that we try to avoid as well. So all those are considered the, in, in any of our planning. Why isn't the ice that's there presumably sublimated over the millennia? Why didn't it? S sublimate. Doesn't ice? Yeah. So, so uh, today, if you're, you're on the surface of Mars, any liquid water will sublimate. The reason that the Icy ice ex uh, water exists. It's just because it's the, it's the uh, uh, and it's, be, it's existed at certain pressure, so you can be hiding underneath the, the soil and so on. And it's so cold that uh, solid ice can exist, and it becomes liquid. Yes, it sublimates right away. Is there a question over there? Mm -hmm. yeah. Dick, is there any attempt at all? Oh, do I know? Sorry. Is there any attempt at all to have a sort of fundraising? I mean, I was impressed that f you need $8 per person. <laughs> that seems like a worthy contribution and one that, you know, there are other sources than the Koch brothers for what they do. <laughs> could, we, could we get another group going on this? Um, <laughs> I mean, in I, other words, I, I using private idea. sources. I, I think it's a good, good idea. Uh, I think uh, that they may come with all this internet, uh, you know, crowd fundraising that, that it might help us. But to be honest, the, the thing that would help us the most is for you to express an interest to the legislative people or to the executive branch or to anybody that, that, you, that you interact with and, and say that, hey, you know, this is something that the U.S. should do. Uh, let me mention one thing. I'm, I'm running out of time, but, but I do want to address it this way. One of the key legacies of our activities, aside from learning the science, aside from developing the, the technology and the capability know-hows, is actually to inspire the younger generation. Some of the people that work on, at JPL now and other places at NASA, uh, they were students 
And they, I remember watching the, the Apollo landing. I was in Hong Kong still at that time. I was a teenager walking along the street and then all of a sudden the, all the TV you know, station was showing this. I wasn't sure I was inspired, but I was certainly uh, thinking, wow, this thing happened. It was very impressionable. And I believe that some of the younger, younger generations, uh, uh, with what we do, if we can inspire them to go into the scientific field and become the future people working at JPL, you know, I'm so old, you know, they, they have to replace me soon enough. And, and that might be a, another reason why the country would po want to put money, you know, whether going to, with people going to Mars or just robotically speaking. Yes. Uh, doctor, could you explain uh, and break down the kinds of activities that are going on at JPL that might not be, you know, a Mar the Mars sure. missions? But sure. There are lots of other things you're doing. Yeah. Uh, JPL really has uh, three or four major categories of work. Uh, one is actually studying Earth. There is about, actually, one third of our business, roughly, is studying Earth. You know, sending satellite up there to look at various types of geophysical measurements around Earth, uh, the, the sea level, the, the and, and clouds, and and so on. And there is about there is Mars exploration, but then there is also planetary exploration in general. So there are good people. We're sending a, a spacecraft to Jupiter as we speak. One of our spacecraft has already visited one asteroid and is on its way to a second asteroid. So there are, uh, and then there is the Cassini spacecraft, which is orbiting around Saturn right now. So we have planetary exploration, and then we also do some work in astronomy. We we uh, we, we build and are flying a mission called uh, Spitzer. It's an infrared telescope. So JPL does a, a, a spectrum of. Uh, solar system exploration, astronomy, and Earth. And we also have what we call the deep space network. Uh, when the spacecraft are very far from Earth, when they relay the data back, we need big antennas to capture those signals. And there are three major stations around the globe, uh, one at, uh, in Goldstone, one in Spain, and one in uh, Australia, listening to those very weak signals from spacecraft far away. So GPL, that, that kind of summarizes what GPL does. Thank you so much, Dr. Lee. I, I think all of us can agree that the country got a lot for its $8. I hope you get many more. You haven't been here before, but to hold this crowd with this attention, with this little leakage, is a real tribute to you and to your subject. And we greatly appreciate it. Thank you for spending the time with me. I appreciate it. I hope we'll see all of you in a month when we're going to hear from Dahlia Dasa Kay, who's a RAND expert on the Middle East, and will be making a, another outstanding presentation. Thank you.